And I think the, that time when Jesus gave his life on the cross at Calvary and then they took his body down from the cross and put him in a tomb, this was the only passive time in Jesus' life. Because you have to remember that a lot of people are trying to do away with it at the moment. Jesus was actually dead. He died on the cross. They didn't take his life. He gave his life, but he was dead. When they put him in the tomb, he was dead. His blood had already been shed. His heart had stopped. Everything had stopped. He was dead. Jesus didn't raise himself. But into that tomb came the power of God, the Holy Ghost himself, and called Jesus up out of the dead. How amazing is that? Just like Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, the Holy Ghost called our Jesus up out of the tomb. And the Bible says that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. And I find it very difficult at, in this time that people who, who actually claim to know Christ but want to deny the resurrection, they don't know Jesus at all. How can they when the resurrection is so powerful and such a, an amazing part of the gospel message? It, it, it truly is. I want to read a scripture to you from 1 Corinthians. Right on that very subject, Paul deals with this. Because it's not only now that some people are trying to do, do away with the miraculous out of God. You know, God is still a miracle working God. He's a miraculous God. And if you need a miracle, He's the only one who can supply. I can pray, but I can't do miracles. Some of you might think I can, but you're wrong. There's only one miracle worker. Amen. His name is Christ Jesus, our Lord. But that's not just today. Paul was dealing with this issue also. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, I'll read the first part from verse 12, where Paul deals with this issue. He says, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, Paul says. And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. In fact, if the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That's those who have died. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. <laughs> Verse 20, it gets good. But now Christ is risen <laughs> from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's died. You know, notice how he never used the word people died in Christ. They have fallen asleep. I love it. Because they, they're not finished. They're not finished. He says, for, let me carry on. This is too good to stop. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Amen. I used to, when I was a young Christian and I first used to hear that Christ was the first to be uh, raised from the dead, I read my Bible and, you know, there's many people who have been raised from the dead in the Bible. Many people have been raised from the dead even since the Bible's been written. 
Our brother James Jacob was risen from the dead, our Indian brother. You know, and, uh, but there's a big difference. There's a big difference between resuscitation and resurrection. See, you might die here this morning, Albert, and I could come and pray for you and raise you from the dead. But do you know what? You'd still be Albert the sinner. You'd still have your sinful body, your sin nature. But when Jesus was risen from the dead, the Bible says, well, let me go back here and read. I know there's a bit further on. Let me read from verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and it's raised in incorruption. See, when we get raised by Christ at the end, we're going to put off this old corrupt body and put on a body of incorruption like Jesus did. See, he was sown. Oh, come on, let me keep reading. Lucky I'm not on that stage. I'd have been falling off the front this morning. He says, it's sown in dishonor and raised in glory, sown in weakness and raised in power. That's verse 42, 43 and 44 of the same chapter. See, Christ took upon himself your sin and my sin on that cross. And when he died, he died to pay the price of that sin because sin requires a death to pay the price. Paul writes in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in chapter 3 and in, verse, in chapter 6. He said, and the wages of sin is death. When Jesus had your sin and my sin, he had to die to pay the price to satisfy his Father in heaven. And when his Father was satisfied that the blood of his Son had paid the price of all sin, then Jesus could be raised with no sin. He went to the cross with no sin, took your sin, got rid of your sin and was raised without it, raised in incorruption. And so will you be for those who are trusting in his name. Amen. When he says says there that all shall live, that's all shall live who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're found in him, there will be no condemnation. Hallelujah. See, you've got to go right back to Genesis to get God's story. First of all, you must believe that God is totally sovereign and he knows what he's doing. There was never a time when God thought, I'm not sure how to go, what to do now. You know, God doesn't think like you think. He does think because he says his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But God, never never any time has God thought, I'm not sure what to do now. I'll have to have a think about this and talk to Jesus and the Holy Ghost and see if we can come up with a better plan. Now he had a plan right from the very beginning. And when the Bible says in the beginning, they were the words of Moses. Because God never had a beginning. It was only a beginning as we know it. As we know it. And so so God is so sovereign, so powerful, so all-knowing, so all-powerful, so all-present that he knows everything from the beginning to the end. When he was setting up the story in Genesis, he already had revelation in mind because he set up time system. He set up seasons. And then out of that time and seasons came feasts and celebrations and so Jesus, so the, the Jews were celebrating Passover way back in Exodus. And Jesus w- was celebrating Passover right up here in the Gospels when he went to the cross. God knows what he's doing, people. He's got it all planned. He's got your life planned, Anthony. Right from before you was a twinkle in your daddy's eye. The Bible says he knew you before the foundations of the world. And he had a plan for you and a purpose for your life. And it was a good plan and a good purpose. Because God is not evil. He's good. Amen. And if we stick with him, we will follow the plan. He is so, so amazing. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. I just got to read this story because I love it so much. Verse 1, chapter 28 of Matthew. Now after the Sabbath. See, there it is. When did God set up the Sabbath? Right back in Exodus. Actually before that, right back in Genesis. He was already planning all that. He'd planned all that. 
not planning. He doesn't plan. He planned. He knows it all. He knows the end. Or you're, there is no end. Did you know that? When we say beginning and end, that's just our words. In God, there's no beginning and there's no end. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn. That's why church is why we meet on Sundays. Because we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was raised on a Sunday. We're not Jews. We don't meet on Saturdays and Sabbath, that type of Sabbath. Paul says, and uh, on the first day of the week when you meet together, take up the collection. <laughs> People say, oh, you should keep the Sabbath. Doesn't the law say keep the Sabbath? Sunday. Oh, every day is the Lord's day. Amen. No good just coming to church on Sunday and behaving yourself. Every day is the Lord's day. I'm not going to get very far if I keep preaching every line. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Don't you love angels? His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. How do you West Australians know anything about as white as snow? And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. I love that because that actually transitions from that whole resurrection story. See, the resurrection has, has many meanings, but the greatest meaning to me, it was proof that he was God. That he'd done what he came to do. He said it's finished and it was finished. He paid the price. The Spirit of God had raised him up from the dead and he'd done what he came to do. The resurrection proves it, that he was God. Amazing. You know, but there's so much in this, in this whole story. But I see because God's story goes completely, it doesn't stop at the resurrection. He was resurrected. He said he's not here. He's been raised from the dead. And he's gone ahead of you into Galilee. And he'll meet you there. So I love Jesus. Do you know what? He, he could have been raised from the dead whooshed up to the right hand of the Father, and he really didn't have to show himself to anybody. He had already told them what was going to happen. He would already told them that on the third day he would be restored, he would be risen, but the disciples didn't know what he was talking about then. They'd never known anything like that to happen. And Jesus could have just gone straight up to the right hand of the Father and left them with what he told them to get on with it. No, that's not my Jesus. He's more personal than that. So they go. So turn over. You can go to Acts chapter 1. Oh, now we'll get into something. So he goes ahead of them, just like he says. He always does what he says, Jesus. And he goes ahead of them. And he meets up with them. Remember, he meets them up in the, in the room. And he comes into the room. And uh, they're all in fear. I just love Jesus. Because he comes and shows himself to them. To prove that he did what he said he was going to do. He didn't need to prove himself. But he did. And there was a guy who was missing from that meeting. Anyone know his name? Thomas. We're always late, us Thomases. And he was missing from the room. 
and they saw the Lord. And when they saw Thomas, they said, we saw the Lord. And he was reluctant to believe them. And he said, until I see the holes in his hands, or put my fingers in the holes in his hands, I'll not believe. And do you know what? Jesus came back to that group for a second time, just for Thomas. Just for Thomas. When he came, and Jesus just held out his hand. Touch. And Thomas said, I don't need to, Lord. Now I've seen you, now I know. And Jesus said these words, Blessed are you, Thomas, for you have seen and believed, but more blessed are those who do not see but believe. He was talking about us, Albert. Talking about us. And I want to go somewhere with this for a few minutes because there's something missing in our lives people of God and that's why we struggle so much sometimes to live this life as a Christian Christianity is not hard to live but it is if we try to live it in the flesh Paul says it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me nevertheless this life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who died and gave his life for me amen it's in Galatians chapter 2 So he, he shows himself, and on Friday I said, you know, the graves opened and people come out. Those who, who died in Christ were risen out of the graves. Not those sinners who died, but those who were believing was, were risen up. I wonder what happened to them. Did you know, Margaret, whatever happened to those guys? Do you reckon they went back into the grave? <laughs> Yeah, they were they were resuscitated, not resurrected. Or maybe they he whooped them up. I don't know. Bible leaves us with a little bit of uh, license to imagine. So here in Acts chapter one, verse four, it says, "And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait." For the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What Jesus was saying was, I want you to go and be my witnesses. Remember what he said at the end of the book of Matthew, uh, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. But before you go, he's saying here, before you go and do everything that I've said, I need to give you something to go with. And I see today's church, not this group of people today's world church are missing what Jesus told them there after his resurrection he'd done the work Jesus had done the work on the cross in the tomb and in the resurrection power to get you saved those of you who are believing on Jesus for your salvation walking according to his word he's done all that so you could be saved but now he wants to send you but first he has a gift for you. He said, don't leave Jerusalem. That was their hometown. That was their, their, their starting point. Don't you leave Jerusalem until you have received the promise of the Father which you have heard from me. He's talking of the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, oh, they asked him something there. Therefore, when they had when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, will you restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? And he said, it's not for you to know the time or the season which your father has put in his own authority. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he said, don't go anywhere, don't do anything until you are endured with power from on high. 
Go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Holy Spirit. Follow the words of Jesus out of the Bible, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And many people are trying to live a Christian life in the flesh, not being led by the Holy Spirit. He says, those who are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. And if you are led by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But we actually, some are trying to go unempowered by the Holy Spirit. There's a story. I know, see, when when you receive Jesus as your Savior, you have the life of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. But many people don't understand that. This is also in the Bible. Paul, on his missionary journey, he's on his way to Ephesus. You can read this in Acts chapter 19. And as he's entering into Ephesus, he comes across a bunch of people who are believers. Now, you're you're talking Acts chapter 19 now. It's a long time since Jesus has paid the price on the cross, been resurrected, sent him in. Paul's got saved in the midst of all that time. Now he's going into Ephesus and he he bumps into a bunch of believers. You can go read it from verse 1 in Acts chapter 19. And he's and uh, they're obviously believers. You know, I love it when I'm in India, and uh, you can always tell the believers because uh, when you see some people, they say Namaste, and uh, some people say Wanna come if you're in Tam- if you're in Tamil Nadu, and but when you meet a believer and they greet you, the normal greeting is Praise the Lord in English, Praise the Lord. So you know the brothers and sisters because they all greet you with Praise the Lord. But Paul had bumped into these guys who he obviously knew were believers. And he said to them, do you want to turn there and read that? He said to them, uh, with which baptism was you baptized? Ah, come on, let me show you. I need you to turn to your Bibles. Where did I say? 19, wasn't it? Oh, here we go then. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And so I'm not, I don't make this stuff up. It's in the Bible. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. What the heck was John the Baptist preaching? He got these boys saved and he hadn't even told them about the Holy Spirit. That should say something to you when you're preaching the gospel to somebody. Don't forget the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And the men were about 12 in all. So these people were believing on Jesus, were baptized with John's baptism of repentance unto salvation, but they hadn't even got a handle on the Holy Spirit. And Paul, knowing the fullness of a Christian walk, would have said to them, you can't walk like this without the Holy Spirit. You can't live for Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Who do you think you are? You've got to live a life in the, in the flesh, in just what you know, and follow Jesus. You're going to, be, you're going to stumble over everything that's put in front of you. You need the Holy Spirit. And so in the modern church today, not only are some people trying to get rid of the the miraculous resurrection, they're trying to get rid of the Holy Spirit as well. How can you? He's God. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you need the Holy Spirit. You need the full gospel. There's a group called the Full Gospel Men's Fellowship. And they don't even preach the full gospel, Joe. The full gospel starts right back in Genesis. 
And God created the heavens and the earth. It was all God. It's always been all God. It was always God. It's always going to be God. A man has twisted and turned the scriptures to suit their own lives. And now we're finding that they've been twisted so much. Every now and again, we need a reformation to bring the truth back of the gospel. And the gospel is this. God created man. Amen. And Satan came and deceived man into disobeying God and sin entered the world. Did God know about it, Adrian? God knew everything. It was all in his plan. It was all in his plan. And sin entered the world through one man and through that one man entered into every person that was born of man on this planet. 4,000 years passed. And God sent his only son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin. That's another part they're trying to take out of the Bible. Born of a virgin, because he wasn't born of the seed of man. He was born of the seed of God. Amen? He was 100% man, 100% God. He lived a sinless life. Some of the junk that people want to talk about, my Jesus, whilst he was here in the 33 and a half years that he lived on planet Earth, in the body of a man, they can't, people on this Earth can't handle someone who's sinless. They want to make up stories about him. Oh, how he loved Lazarus. There must have been something wrong with him. My Jesus was sinless and he lived a sinless life and he came for one purpose and one purpose only and that was the cross at Calvary that we were celebrating this weekend. That he would go and die upon that cross and shed his blood for the sin of mankind and he paid the price, the full price of your sin, past, present, future. I had trouble with that growing up. How could God forgive me for something I've not yet done? God got me alone one night and he said, when did I forgive you of your sin, son? I said, when I asked you to forgive me, Lord. He didn't answer me. You know when God don't answer you, you ain't got the question right. He just said it again. It's like you did with Peter. Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you. And he... Jesus asked the question again, right? So obviously Peter didn't get it right first time. So he said to me the second time, Son, when did I forgive you of all your sin? And I da- named the date. Lord, when I got on my knees and asked you to forgive me, he didn't answer me. He asked me again, Son, when did I forgive you of all your sin? I am a bit slow, but I'm not too slow. And the penny did drop. As I fell on my knees and said, Lord, on Calvary's cross, you forgave me of all my sin. And he said, and how many of your sins were in the future? I said, all of them, Lord. The ones that I've done, the ones I'm thinking about today, and the ones I'll think about tomorrow. All of them. And that's the gospel, people of God. That Jesus paid the price for our sin. And he gave his life. They said, He said, you don't take my life. Couldn't I call 12 legions of angels to destroy you all right now? And the Bible says he gave up his spirit. He died to pay the full price of your sin. And they took his body down off of that cross. They would have left him there to rot. But the Sabbath was due. Six o'clock on Friday night, Sabbath time. It's when the Sabbath starts. So they took his body down. Normally they would break the legs of the people hanging on the cross so that they die more quickly. But when they come to Jesus, they couldn't break his legs because the Bible says not a bone in his body was broken. And they looked and he was already dead. They checked, put, put the spear in his side, took him down off the cross, put him in the tomb. 
And go read the story about how the Pharisees wanted protection because if he did rise and there was no one protecting him, they would, they could, they would say, oh, his disciples came and took him in the night. Go protect that tomb. On that Sunday morning, the Spirit of God entered that tomb. The Holy Spirit himself. That same Holy Spirit that's going to be with you, Nathan, every day of your life to help you live this life. That same Holy Spirit that's going to be with us all as we call upon his name and raised our Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. And that same Holy Spirit is what I want to push home to you today. He is the Spirit of God who dwells with you, who will walk with you, and you will walk with Him, and He will protect you, and He will watch over you, and He will give you discernment. He will tell you of things to come. He will reveal truth to you of the Word of God as you read. It's the Holy Spirit that takes those words off the page and puts them not into your ears, your eyes, but in your heart, and He will direct your life, and He will get you home. Amen? But you know, you can be saved here this morning, and you can not even realize the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. See, there's an acknowledgement. in Jesus say that he died for, you, for all? But it's only those who acknowledge. I'm still trying to work that out. If we was dead in our sin, did we get raised first or did we acknowledge first? He had to raise me first so I could acknowledge him. Dead people can't do anything. I was dead in my sin. But you know, I responded to God's call and he saved my life. Now the Holy Spirit is resident in every born again believer. But we need to find that place where we respond to the Holy Spirit. I remember I was saved for a number of years uh, before I even knew about the full work of the Holy Spirit. And then one day, I was taking my dog for a walk. I was on Mount Hawthorne Park. Cars were flying down by the freeway there. And I was in the middle of the park there. And I cried out to God, fill me with your spirit, Lord. And he did. And sometimes that's acknowledgement. This is what Acts 19 is about. Let me pray for you. You pray. Cry out to God. God, I need your spirit. I need to acknowledge the Holy Spirit in my heart. And this is the only way this church is going to make it. This is the only way you are going to make it if we acknowledge the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is what Christ was resurrected for. Because didn't he say, the Spirit of God can't come until I go? Did he go? Did Jesus go? Hallelujah. Did the Holy Ghost come? Then he's here for you. Call upon his name today. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you've heard this for the first time. Maybe you've heard about it, but you've never really thought about it that much and thought, well, Spirit of God lives in me, but I don't hear Him much. Maybe talk to Him. Maybe call upon His name. He will actually help you. I want to pray, Father in heaven, make us aware of Your Spirit. Make us aware of Your Holy Spirit. You have given us the best gift. You gave us Jesus to die for us and you gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us and comfort us and befriend us and walk with us. Lord, we accept Jesus as our Savior and we thank you for it. We want to accept your Spirit this morning in our hearts. If that's you this morning and you've never you know, like prayed to God to, to receive His Spirit, I want to encourage you to do that today. Every person close their eyes for a second. 
If it's you this morning, if you want the Holy Spirit in your heart that you would recognize His work, just, just lift your hand. No one's watching. Just lift your hand. Is that you? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. There. Just do it. I want you to pray this prayer with me. You people who raised your hand, and even if you didn't raise your hand, why don't you just come, come forward? There's a heap of space here. I want to pray for you. Just like Paul said to the Ephesians, he said those guys he met, he says, and when he laid hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Why don't you come? You people are like, I'm, like just come. Just come. God's going to do a miracle in your life right now. He's going to touch your life right now. Thank you, Lord. Just all of you, come. Come. Maybe you can all pray this prayer, but especially those ones who desire the Spirit of God. Say, Father in heaven, fill me with your Spirit. Let him take control of my life. I receive the Holy Spirit today from your word you have shown us not to do anything not to go anywhere until we are endured with power from on high the only power from on high I know is the Spirit of God the power of God now come Holy Spirit fill my heart Fill my mind. Fill my life. In Jesus' name. And as I lay hands on you this morning, filled with the Holy Spirit right now.